Well, let me first give you the core ideas of Turiel's definitions, uh, the definitions that he and his followers have offered. First idea, moral rules are uh, held to have an objective prescriptive force. They don't depend on authority of any individual or institution, according to Turiel. Secondly, moral rules are spatially and temporally general. Uh, if they apply here and now, they also apply elsewhere and elsewhen. Uh, third, uh, moral rules are the kinds of rules uh, whose violation typically has a victim who's been harmed, whose rights have been violated, or who has been the victim of an injustice. And throughout this talk, by the way, I should mention it now, I'm going to be focusing on harm because although the official position is harm, rights, uh, <clears throat> or justice, uh, in fact, uh, the overwhelming majority, in fact, perhaps maybe even all of the studies, have focused on uh, <clears throat> harm when they're looking at this claim. Uh, and finally, uh, violations of moral rules are typically more serious than violations of conventional rules. Well, the core idea of Turiel and his followers' definition of conventional rules are, in a certain sense, predictable from what I've just said. They're just the opposite. Conventional rules are arbitrary, situation-dependent, they don't have an objective prescriptive force. They can be suspended or changed by an appropriate authority. They are often geographically and temporally local. They may apply in one culture uh, <clears throat> or in one setting but not another. Uh, they do not involve a victim who has been harmed, whose rights have been violated or has been subject to an injustice. And typically, at least, uh, they are less serious than violations of moral rules. Well, guided by those definitions, Turiel and his associates uh, developed an experimental paradigm that has become known as the moral conventional task. Uh, and this has been one of the most influential experimental paradigms in the moral psychology literature. So what happens uh, in a moral conventional task experiment? The participants in the experiment are presented with examples of transgressions of prototypical moral rules and prototypical conventional rules. And then they're asked a series of probe questions designed to determine whether they think uh, the action described in this vignette, this story, uh, is wrong, and if so, how serious uh, the wrong is. Uh, whether the participants think that the wrongness uh, of the transgression is authority dependent or not. So for example, a participant who has said that a specific rule violating act is wrong might be asked, uh, well, what if the teacher, so this would be in a school context, obviously, uh, what if the teacher said there is no rule in this school about that sort of act? Would it be right then? Uh, this is one of the many ways in which you can probe authority dependence or independence. Uh, third, the participants are, are asked whether they think the rule is general in scope. Is it applicable in other countries at other times? And finally, they're asked how they would justify their moral judgment. Uh, what the experimenters are looking for is, do they appeal to harm justice or rights, on the one hand, or to something else? And the answers to these questions uh, are uh, what have been called in the literature, and I'll, I'll use this term from time to time, criterion judgments. Well, the early results in this experimental paradigm uh, were truly uh, impressive. Uh, they strongly suggested uh, that the definition that Turiel and his uh, associates uh, had put forward was psychologically important. Uh, <clears throat> when asked about a prototypical moral transgression, for example, one child hitting another unprovoked, one child pushing another off a swing in a school, uh, and about prototypical conventional transgressions, like a child talking in class when uh, he hasn't been called upon by the teacher, or a boy wearing a dress to school. Participants differed systematically, uh, and they differed in just, so the answers they gave about these were systematically different to the answers they gave about these, and it seemed in just the way that Turiel's definitions suggested. In particular, transgressions of prototypical moral rules, as I say, almost all of which involved a clear harm, like pushing a kid off a swing, uh, were said to be wrong and more serious than conventional transgressions. 
not authority dependent, general in scope, and they were justified by appeal to harm. Transgressions of the prototypical conventional rules were wrong but less serious, authority dependent, not general in scope, and, less, uh, and they weren't justified by uh, appeal uh, to harm. Well, during the last 30 years there have been, I've lost count last time I looked, something like 80 published papers, maybe by now it's over 100, um, and uh, these papers have found that pattern of results in an impressively diverse range of participants. Uh, participants of different ages, for example, uh, ranging from a little bit controversial as to whether you can get it at three and a half years, but certainly it's there by four and a half or five years, all the way up through adults, okay? Uh, but also participants of different nationalities and cultures, including all of those, I find that this is easier to take in that way, uh, so uh, those are uh, amongst the field sites uh, where uh, this experiment has been tried. And participants of very different religions, uh, including all of these. And uh, I guess <clears throat> I had trouble finding a picture of Dutch Reformed children. It's not clear that they look like anything special. Uh, so, Well, what conclusions are we to draw from these results? The answer here is a little bit difficult, uh, because Turiel and his followers are heavily influenced by the work of Piaget and Kohlberg, and I know I'm going to get in trouble for this, but I'll say it anyhow. Uh, and, um, in my view, uh, Piaget and Kohlberg are uh, partial to a rather obscure terminology uh, and to some philosophically tendentious concepts, uh, and some of those are picked up and indeed added to uh, in the Turiel tradition. So, rather than trying to get involved, I'd be happy to do this in discussion or during the month I'll be in Paris, uh, be happy to get involved in textual exegesis because I think the account I'm giving may indeed be the most generous account of what Turiel has in mind, but I'm not going to claim that uh, because that's a hard case to make given how difficult uh, much of the text is. Rather, what I want to do uh, is offer some conclusions which, first of all, are plausible to draw from these findings, and secondly, which unquestionably most of the philosophers, most of the moral theorists who have been impressed by the moral conventional task, who have used and cited the moral conventional task, do in fact apparently accept. All right, so I'm going to offer you two sets of conclusions. Um, apologies for the numbering system, I couldn't think of a better way to do this. Uh, but uh, the first set of conclusions, in effect, generalize the results. They say the results are specific instances of more general patterns. The second conclusion is a conclusion that maintains that those generalizations support an important claim about the nature or the definition of morality. So let me start first uh, with the generalizing ones, uh, and I think there are three of these. First of all, uh, what I will call the clustering of criterion judgments. So the idea here is, just as we found in the experiments I pointed out to you, uh, that in moral conventional tasks uh, you get clustered answers, the claim here is that there are really only two what I'll call signature response patterns that people in moral conventional tasks typically, at least, or overwhelmingly, give you one of two signature response patterns. The signature moral pattern is the pattern where rules are judged to be, not surprisingly, authority independent, general in scope, serious, and justified by appeal to harm. The signature conventional pattern uh, is the pattern where uh, the uh, <clears throat> uh, rules are authority dependent, not general in scope, transgressions are less serious, and uh, they, are justified, they are not justified by appeal to harm. So you've got two signature patterns. And furthermore, these signature patterns are what philosophers of science uh, like to call nomological clusters or homeostatic clusters. And here I have in mind roughly the account of these notions that you'll find in the work of philosophers like Richard Boyd. Uh, that is to say, there's a strong law-like convention, a, a tendency uh, for the members of the clusters to occur together. All right, so there's one conclusion, the clustering. Uh, you only get two clusters amongst a uh, large number of possible clusters of answers you could get. 
Secondly, the response patterns, those clusters, correlate with transgression types. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, each pattern is reliably evoked by a certain type of transgression. In particular, transgressions involving harm or justice or rights, but, and so I'll often say harm, justice, and rights, HJR, but in fact all the experiments focus on harm, uh, uh, that uh, transgressions involving harm evoke the signature moral pattern. On the other hand, transgressions that don't involve harm, justice, or rights evoke the signature conventional pattern. Third, uh, what I'll call the universality conclusion, the regularities I've just described are pancultural and they emerge quite early in development. <clears throat>